Okay, today we're going to talk about diseases of the musculoskeletal system within animals. The musculoskeletal system, as you've already learned, is responsible for movement and shape in all animals. Animals must be able to move, find food, seek shelter, and escape predators to survive. Without your rigid frame, the skeleton, and flexible articulations, the joints, and the systems of pulleys, muscles, tendons, and ligaments, animals would be little more than lumps of tissue. The integration of these systems provides movement, one of the basic characteristics of life. So any disruption of the musculoskeletal system can occur as a result of the following. Here are the diseases we're going to talk about. Trauma, fractures, ligament ruptures, luxations, degenerative disease like osteochondritis desiccans or OCD, degenerative joint disease or DJD, and non-united anconeal processes. Just some different things that we'll talk about. Inflammation, myositis, panosteitis, poor conformation, a luxating patella, and of course, cancer. Injuries that involve the musculoskeletal system are painful. If an animal is limping, unless, and sometimes even if you can find a limb that is shorter than another, then limping indicates pain. Analgesics or pain relief should be used to increase the comfort of the patient. A pain-free patient will not only be more comfortable while healing, but they will actually be able to function normally again more rapidly, which means they're going to heal more quickly. Any disease or malfunction of the system compromises the animal's ability to maintain homeostasis within its environment. Long bone fractures. At least three-fourths of long bone fractures occur as a result of motor vehicle accidents. Please belt up your pets. Keep them confined. Do not let them ride on your lap or in the back of a pickup truck. This is dangerous for you and it's dangerous for your animal. Other causes can include indirect violence, bone disease, or repeated stress. These fractures can be classified as open or closed, which means they're open to the environment or enclosed within the body, splintered or fragmented, and stable or unstable. And the type of fracture and its location determine the best method of repair. The job of the veterinary technician, your job is to quickly assess the patient, especially in the case of a motor vehicle accident. After treatment for shock, hemorrhage, and soft tissue trauma, the possibility of fracture should be addressed. Let me say that again. You treat them after treatment for shock, hemorrhage, and soft tissue trauma. Technicians should always be aware that fractures might exist, and they should take care when they're moving the animal to protect any areas of suspected fractures. We can use support bandages, such as the Robert Jones bandage or the modified Robert Jones bandage, and if possible, if we can put those on, and we want to make... Um, Careful, be careful not to make the injury worse by restraint methods or handling when we're obtaining radiographs. If you can sedate the animal without causing more problems, then that's a, a good thing to use. Here are some descriptions of some typical fractures that we see. This is a fissured fracture, usually due to stress, repeated stress on the um, on the bone. And here you see it going all the way down past the epiphyseal growth plate, which is an issue, and into the uh, joint. This is a green stick fracture. A green stick fracture, if you have ever taken a uh, stick that has just been cut off a tree, and it, if you've tried to break it and it just bends and then splinters on one side, but it's completely whole on the outside, does not open up at all, that is called a green stick fracture fracture. Um, it's, it happens more in young animals. Remember that their bones develop from cartilage, and so their bones are typically a little bit more rubbery, like a young um, or still living branch. And so you can bend them, but they don't break really easy. So instead, they'll just fracture um, splinter on one side. So this is a common injury of young animals. And unfortunately, it's typically an injury of um, trauma due to somebody holding and twisting and um, abuse, basically. So when we see green stick fracture, we have to really kind of understand exactly what happened to make this fracture. A transverse fracture is a relatively clean uh, break from side to side. It goes transversely across um, uh, the bone. There's a common nuded fracture, which is um, basically what we, we call a, a 
complex fracture, it is broken into several pieces. And sometimes those pieces don't line up exactly. And sometimes they're in the muscle or they're in another part of the leg. And so it can create more problems. And then we have oblique fractures. Oblique fractures don't go straight across the bone. They go from one a higher end to a lower end across the bone. So what do we see? We will have obviously a history of trauma. Um, sometimes people don't witness the trauma. They just see that there are things um, that have been broken in the house or something falls off a, a, um, a refrigerator or a bookshelf and then they have this animal that is uh, limping. Pain or localized ten tenderness, we can feel the area and they, they really respond to that. Lameness, deformity of the bone. So obviously if the bone is sticking in the wrong direction, it's fractured. Loss of function, they can't use it at all. Crepitus means there's a crackling sound or a crackling feeling around that bone and then localized swelling or bruising. Obviously, we want to get x-rays, at least two views. And the reason is that a, a, a fracture can look as if it's completely lined up when you look at one view. And if you turn it sideways, that fracture, you will see that one portion is in front of the other. It's hard to see just in one view. We need to be able to do that in order to diagnose and characterize that fracture. Radiographs of the opposite limb done for comparison can be very helpful. And then we want to do reduction, which means to put it back together, and fixation of the fracture, which means to hold it together as, uh, as soon as that patient is stable. Some ways we can fix the long bone fractures. We can use splints. These are placed to hold the fracture segments in the reduced position while healing occurs. Its use is uh, usually limited to limbs, so distal limbs, below the elbow, below the knee. We want to make sure that we use adequate padding to prevent the splint from causing soft tissue injury. And we need to keep that splint and bandage dry and restrict activity. If we have problems with the splint that uh, we see foul odor, we have swelling around the splint, we have pain, fever, they're chewing on the splint or they're generalized, uh, generally depressed, that means that the splint as it's put on right now is not working appropriately. Casts are made of plaster of Paris or another rigid moldable material, and their function is very much like splints. They uh, will hold the fracture in place. Now, casts typically go all the way around a limb, and splints just um, splint one side of the limb. What we have to remember is that casts and splints may not prevent movement, either rotation or overriding of those fracture pieces, um, so that will really result in delayed healing or non-union of some fractures. Let's go back and look at the types of fractures. So a splint or a cast would help in fractures that are already pretty much together. So a fissured fracture, a green stick fracture, uh, it would be very helpful with. And sometimes even with a transverse fracture, especially if we have this little um, notch here that will keep that bone from rotating on itself. So those fractures can be very helpful. Here, when we have lots of pieces or we have a way that the, the um, fracture can get the bone, the top bone can move down with the pressure. It can move, um, it glance off of that, that obliqueness, the oblique angle and move down. That will be a problem. Those casts or splints won't work for that. Intramedullary pins, they don't actually provide, intramedullary means right through the bone marrow. So in the center, putting pins, they don't provide very rigid stability. They can be used in combination with other methods and they help to prevent a rotation of one part or the other of the, of the fracture of the bone. They usually require removal after the fracture has healed and we do need to insert them under sterile conditions. So we need to, anything we do when we're touching the bone or opening up the bone or the joint, we, it needs to be sterile. Um, they can help to promote healing uh, in adult dogs uh, in about 7 to 12 weeks. They can also migrate out because the body doesn't like those um, abnormal foreign things in it. And so it will actually push it out. Bone plates. Bone plates are great. They do need to be put on by somebody who has been specially uh, trained on it. Um, they work well on most long bone fractures. They should always be removed after healing is, is complete, but sometimes they are left in place um, unless they break or they interfere with normal bone growth in animals or they become irritated or infected. Um, if, if we do have bone union at about 5 to 12 
uh, months in adult dogs, we can remove them. Um, they do require specialized instrumentation and surgical technique, and they do provide an early return to function. So we can get this really nasty fractured um, limb and they'll be walking out of surgery or at least limping a little bit, whereas before they couldn't put anything, any weight on it. So clients need to know that activity is going to need to be restricted while the bone is healing. Leash walking and cage rest may be required for five to eight weeks. Report any evidence of drainage, swelling, or heat in the affected limb. We're going to need to do radiographs, uh, follow-up radiographs, because we need to assess if it's healed or not, if we can remove any devices. If we have to do surgery, we may need to um, remove the pin or plate after healing. And if they do have metal in their limbs, they can suffer more of a cold sensitivity uh, to when they have plates or pins in their limbs. So if, if that is causing a problem, we may need to remove them. We also have to remember that although we need to restrict their activity, bone heals and, and remodels because of a piezoelectric activity that's occurring. So the more that more vibration that you um, uh, put into your bones, the more you walk, the more you move, the, the more your body is remodeling and replacing bone and healing bone. And if we don't allow these animals to place weight or if they're not able to place weight on this, uh, this leg at all, we're gonna get a non-union. The bone is not gonna heal because it's not getting that vibrational energy to cause that piezoelectrical activity with those bone cells. So that is important uh, to remember one of the reasons why we need to keep them from being painful as much as possible. Another really common injury, especially in dogs, is a cranial cruciate ligament injury, a, a, a cruciate ligament injury. The cruciate, cruciate means cross, and you see these ligaments are crossed. The most often um, damaged uh, ligament in the knee is the cranial or the anterior, so the ACL or the CCL. And this is a cra the cranial cruciate ligament because it starts on the cranial portion of the tibia and goes to the caudal portion of the femur. This is the caudal cruciate ligament. It starts on the caudal portion of the tibia and goes to the cranial portion of the femur. Um, so these are intra-articular structures that help to stabilize the stifle joint. They, it looks like it's on the outside of the joint, but they are actually inside the joint in the middle of the femur and the um, trachea. Rupture of the ACL is possibly the most common injury to the stifle of the dog. It can rupture completely, which uh, means that we have a very unstable joint when they walk, when they put um, pressure on it, you'll see the, the bottom uh, bone, the tibia, moves a little bit independently of the femur, and it should not do that. Um, it could just tear, uh, which produces minor instability and pain. Both injuries will result in degenerative changes within the joint within a few weeks. So we need to see this right away and see if we can get this fixed for them. So we often see this in middle-aged, obese, inactive animals that suddenly hyperextend their stifle joint while exercise. So this picture of this dog chasing the squirrel is typically when we're going to see a problem. So we, uh, we can also see it in animals that are engaged in athletic endeavors, such as racing or jumping. Um, we see it in basketball players. Remember, um, uh, some of these basketball players, when they pivot on their toe, they actually turn their knee the wrong way, and that will cause a a crush or a, a rip of the ACL. We can also see it in skiers. Approximately 50% of the dogs that ligament that rupture their ligament also demonstrate meniscal injury. And the meniscus is that pad of, of cartilaginous tissue that creates a cushion on which the femur bounces off when you walk. Clinical signs. It's a middle-aged obese animal or a highly active athletic animal. Um, sometimes it does happen in cats. What we'll see is there'll be toe touching lameness or non weight bearing on a rear leg, and it'll be all of a sudden. Um, anytime they use the leg, it appears they appear to be in, in pain. What'll happen is that when, the, when they're walking, that tibia will rotate internally because there's nothing to keep it from rotating it as they try to bear weight. If the injury is recent, we may see some joint effusion or swelling of the joint. Um, generally, uh, they go outside and they come back in limping. It's an acute onset. Um, to diagnose it, there is some. There's a test called the positive 
or the cranial drawer test. And if we have a positive cranial drawer movement, um, what we're doing is we're getting the animal on its side and they may need to be sedated. Um, we have them on that side and we hold on to their femur firmly and we take our thumb behind their tibia and try to move it forward. If it moves forward easily in front of the femur, then we know that that cranial cruciate ligament is torn or at least partially torn and it's not holding it in place. We can also do something called a tibial compression test. And this is when the tibia moves forward with respect to the femur when we flex the hock. So we hold onto the femur and we flex the hock by uh, moving the foot up. And if that tibia moves forward again, that tells us that there's nothing holding it in place. Treatment, there are many different surgeries that we can do to stabilize the joint. There are extra articular stabilization techniques and intra articular, meaning we, we uh, don't open the joint, we don't put anything in the joint for extra articular, we put things in the joint for intra articular. Extra articular, we will most often use in animals that weigh less than 15 kilograms. The suture material is placed around the caudal fabella. Remember I said that would, that's a sesamoid bone that would become important later. Um, and that, that sesamoid bone is at the end of the femur on the side. And we, so we put the suture material a, a certain thickness based on their weight um, through a tunnel into the uh, tibial crest and stabilize the joint. We may also imbricate or tighten that joint capsule um, by suturing um, the, the side of the joint capsule a little closer together. Um, and the lateral and medial muscle fascia is performed. We tighten that joint to keep it more stable. The intraarticular stabilization technique is when we do an over-the-top patellar tendon graft. We take a, a strip of the patellar tendon and we use that to replace the cranial cruciate ligament. There is also another uh, surgery that's for, for people who have been specially trained. It's called tibial plateau leveling osteotomy or TPLO. We actually cut the top part of the tibia off and reattach it in a way that prevents it from moving forward against the pull of the hamstring muscles. So it's an interesting technique. It's being used in larger animals. We need to tell the, the client that we are going to restrict exercise for the first three to four weeks. It takes a long time for tendons and ligaments to heal. Um, that means cage rest, leash walking only for elimination right back to the cage. We're going to gradually increase exercise between four to eight weeks after surgery and return to full exercise eight to 12 weeks after surgery. The opposite cruciate will frequently rupture within a year after the first rupture. And I've had two dogs that have ruptured their second cruciate within a few days of the first rupture. Weight reduction will benefit an obese animal. Even if the surgical stabilization is performed, the animal will have some degenerative changes in the joint or arthritis as it ages. Anytime we do a joint surgery, it's going to cause more arthritis in the joint. The pet may require treatment with anti-inflammatory medication if we do get more lameness and pain. All right, so those are lux or those are uh, cruciate ligament ruptures. These are patellar luxations. So it's when the kneecap or that uh, fabella in the front, uh, I'm sorry, the sesamoid bone, the patella, in the front of the knee um, that lies in the groove of the femur is is not straight up and down. Um, so it's not moving straight up and down. It's moving off to the side. That can be a little bit uncomfortable. Patellar luxations occur frequently in dogs and occasionally in cats, and they can be divided into several classes. Medial or lateral luxations. Um, medial luxations we find in toy, miniature, and large, very large breeds. Um, lateral luxations we can also find in toy and miniature breeds. Medial traumatic luxations will be in any breed. Um, the traumatic luxation is because we have some type of rupture of the patellar ligament. And then a, a lateral luxation can also be found in large and giant breeds as well. This is a normal joint. Here is our patellar ligament, um, and it comes from the tendon of the uh, gastrocnemius muscles. Um, and it comes all the way down and joins the uh, joint uh, or the tibia, the cranial portion of the tibia. The patella lays in here. There is also a lateral ligament of the side here. This is the side view of the joint. 
if we have a medial luxation, then the patella moves across these ridges over to the medial side of the leg. If we have a lateral patellar luxation, it moves to the outside of the leg. Medial luxation um, occur often early in life and are not related to trauma. They're often called congenital because they are usually the result of anatomic deformities. And they, uh, these are anatomic deformities that they are born with. Approximately 75 to 80% of patellar luxations are medial displacement. So they almost always go to the inside. Anatomic derangements that predispose an animal to medial luxations include medial bowing of the distal third of the femur, shallow trochlear sulcus, and poorly developed medial ridge, medial torsion of the tibial tubercle, and medial bowing of the proximal tibia. And I'm giving you all those words, and you should be able to figure out what those words mean, but basically there are a lot of different causes for this medial uh, luxation, and it's a physics problem, or it's a construction problem. And the only way that we can tell um, how to fix this is to go in and look at the joint. Um, over time, these derangements are going to put added stress on the cranial cruciate ligaments, which is going to cause them to rupture. So over time, it's going to create big problems. At the time that we diagnose it, usually it's not a major problem. What we have to look for is increasing problems, chronic issues that will um, make us want to do some surgery. So neonates or young puppies with abnormal hind limb function should be examined. Whenever I do a pediatric exam, I always check that, um, uh, that patella and see if I can move it off to the side. If they're young or mature uh, animals and they have abnormal or intermittent gait problems, um, they, then they are probably predisposed to this condition. Older animals with sudden rear leg lameness are predisposed to this condition. What I will often see, and I will describe this to the, to the uh, client, is the animal will be walking along and all of a sudden they may yelp or may say nothing at all and just lift up their rear leg suddenly. They may hop for a few minutes or for a few seconds or even a few steps and then kick out their leg and that pops the patella back into place. So if they're seeing this behavior, that indicates that we have a problem. Now, if they're seeing this behavior multiple times a week, that means that we have an increased problem. I won't wanna do surgery to fix it because I know that surgery um, in increases the chances of arthritis, uh, so I won't want to do surgery unless we do have a chronic and the a problem that is happening or occurring more frequently because we're going to get um, problems anyway at that point. Lateral luxation is usually seen la later in life as soft tissues in the stifle begin to break down. Lateral deviations produce more functional disruption than the medial luxations. We'll see an acute development of lameness often associated with trauma or strenuous exercise a knock knee stance, so they will stand abnormally, um, so that they're actually putting their patellas uh, to, the, to the center. And if it's bilateral, the animal may actually be unable to stand up. In large breed dogs, we'll see it in the same breeds that are affected by hip dysplasia. So it's an abnormal conformation at the hip that results in a medial rotation of the femur, which means that we then have a lateral displacement of the patella. It's usually bilateral, and the animals affected are between five and six months of age. We'll see them be cow hawked, which means their ankles will be turned um, outward. Um, the gait is uh, usually a, a clinical sign, so we'll see them walk in a cow hawked manner. The foot twists laterally when they are weight bearing. Diagnosis is by palpation. We can we can actually move it off to the side, or we can feel the patella on the side. And radiographs will indicate the anatomic deformity sometimes in the patellar displacement. Treatment, surgical correction is the treatment of choice. And it's actually basically a soft tissue surgery. Um, so we have some soft tissue techniques. Sometimes we'll need to do some bone reconstruction, like I said, depending on the construction problem. Usually both knees are corrected at the same time. Um, um, recovery is very easy versus it's much easier than the cranial cruciate, cruciate ligament. Um, issue. So some soft tissue techniques, we can overlap um, either the, the lateral or medial side, the retinaculum, which is the, the fibrous tissue over top of the, the muscle and the joint. And if we overlap it on one side, it just kind of pulls the whole structure off to that side. So if they have a medial luxation, I'm going to do a lateral um, retinaculum overlap. 
We can also overlap the fascia lata, which is another fibrous tissue, um, connective tissue. We can do a patellar and tibia anti-rotational suture. So there's specific sutures that we can use. And there's something called a quadriceps release, which means we take the quadriceps where that patellar tig uh, ligament, sorry, patellar tendon starts, and we can actually release it from the bone, which allows it to move into a more normal location. Um, trocleoplasty is when we take the trochlea, which is the groove in the femur in which the patella and the patellar ligament slide, and we can make that deeper um, so that it can't slip out of that. We can also transpose the tibial tuber tubercle. So if the, the attachment point of that patellar ligament is um, off center, we can actually uh, slice through the bone, move the bone over and reattach it so it's more centered. We can also do an osteo, uh, osteotomy um, or arthrodesis, and that's the joint fusion. So if it's really, really bad, we can fuse that joint so there's no movement. And if there's no movement, there's no pain. Our goal of all surgical correction is to stabilize the stifle and return the patella to its functional position with the joint and keep it there. And so there may be a combination of several techniques that are required. And often I do two or three of these techniques when I'm doing the surgery. And so the, the cost of that will just depend uh, when we get in there, what kind of construction we'll have to do. After surgery, we just want to limit the exercise for two to three weeks. We want to prevent jumping in particular. We may have to put a support bandage on the knee for 10 to 14 days just to protect the surgical site. And we want to keep that dry. Aspirin or other anti-inflammatory drugs can be administered for pain. Physiotherapy, such as swimming or passive flexion extension of the joint 20 to 30 times, four times daily, can be beneficial to animals if they're reluctant to bear weight on the leg. They're going to have some degenerative changes in that joint later in life, but they were going to have it anyway um, if we're having to do surgery. Hip dysplasia is one of the most prevalent disorders of the canine hip, and although it is rarely seen in animals that weigh less than 11 to 12 kilograms, so we see it in larger animals. This is severe hip dysplasia. Here is the acetabulum of the pelvis on both sides and the head of the femur. That head of the femur should, first of all, the acetabulum should be deeper, and the head of the femur should fit nicely as a, as a ball going into a socket, and it doesn't do that. So the head is bigger, the neck is shortened. We have increased bone uh, uh, formation here. It's brighter than normal, which tells us we have a lot of calcium deposits here. And we have more bone formation around the, the outside of the joint where the joint capsule attaches, which tells us that we just have a lot of movement of the bone within this joint. And so it's a reactive bone and it's reacting to this movement and it's a very painful hip. It is complex. And there are some factors um, that have been identified to the development of hip dysplasia. There is a genetic predisposition, and that's why we try to do breedings between animals that, are, that do not carry genes for this disease. Um, and to, in order to do that, we have developed an x-ray, a technique uh, to do x-rays that show us breeding animals' hips. And if they look to be in good conformation, then those are the animals that we want to breed. Environment and dietary factors. So if we overfeed them and cause a, a difference in um, the, the growth of the muscle mass versus the developing skeletal system, that will cause um, a malformation of that hip region. region. Um, and the malformation uh, will cause hip dysplasia. Um, that is why we have large breed puppy food that will actually slow the growth. They'll grow to the same uh, size but it slows their growth to allow the muscle mass and the developing skeletal system to grow at the same time. There can also be a failure of the soft tissues of the hip to maintain joint congruity between the surfaces of the hip joint, resulting in bony changes within the joint. So if we don't have an animal that is using their rear limbs well and they have atrophy of those uh, musculature, then we're gonna have abnormal um, joint uh, congruity or um, uh, joint movement. And so that's going to cause some problems as well. Two types, there's acetabular hip dysplasia. So the, the problem is with the acetabular cup. And most cases of dysplasia are of this acetabular form. There is an excessive slope of the dorsal rim of the acetabulum. Um, and that's where we see the changes. And 
basically it doesn't form enough of a cup for the femoral head to press correctly into that developing um, acetabular cup, which results in damage to that dorsal rim. So we get more movement of the bones within that joint capsule. The osteophyte, there is osteophyte formation and damage to the joint capsule, which results in an unstable and painful joint. Femoral hip dysplasia, in femoral hip dysplasia, the femoral neck is shortened, which decreases the coverage by the acetabular rim and disrupts the congruity of the joint surfaces. In some cases, the femur may be rotated. The joint lacks support from the acetabulum, which leads to osteophyte formation and joint capsule damage with, it, with joint instability. So this is what it's supposed to look like. The acetabulum should be a nice cup and the femoral head should fit within that. In this case, with hip dysplasia, we have a shallow cup. And so this um, head moves around the cup um, a little bit more freely than it should and causes damage to the rim of the cup. Clinical signs will vary with the age of the patient. Young dogs within with, between five and eight months of age and mature animals with chronic disease are predisposed to femoral hip dysplasia. We'll see difficulty in rising and stiffness that diminishes as the animal warms up uh, on exercise. And that's just basic signs of arthritis. Pain can be elicited on the palpation of the dorsal pelvic area over the hip joint. So if we're pushing pretty hard on that dorsal pelvic area, they'll be painful. Um, if I am moving the hip and I take the back leg and I pull it back and we get pain, then we know have, we have pain in the hip joint. In older dogs, lameness, a waddling gait, atrophy of the thigh muscles uh, can be seen from chronic hip dysplasia, dysplasia. Young dogs that are severely affected may be reluctant to stand or move. It'd be very sad to see that. So we want to see radiographic confirmation of this disease. That's essential. The Orthopedic Foundation for Animals, or OFA, has established seven grades of dysplasia. Excellent means they have nearly perfect confirmation. Good means they're normal for age and breed. Fair means they're less than ideal, but within normal limits. And at this point, we're going to start seeing we want good or excellent in order to breed this animal. Fair, if, we ha or if we're bre breeding with an excellent dog, we may not see problems maybe not even till the grand, uh, grand puppies of this uh, breed. Near normal is borderline confirmation. Mild dysplasia means minimal deviation with slight flattened femoral head and subluxation. Moderate dysplasia shows a shallow acetabulum with a flattened femoral head and poor joint congruency. We can diagnose poor joint congruency by seeing those osteophytes. Severe dysplasia is the complete dislocation of the hip with flattening of the acetabulum and femoral head. For OFA certification, dogs should be radiographed after reaching two years of age. Any dog with clinical signs should be radiographed under anesthesia or sedation. We have had people who claim they can do this without sedation. It is not um, allowed for OFA certification. And the other thing that they w have warned us about uh, is that when we are radiographing female dogs in heat, sometimes those dogs in heat will have looser ligaments. And so we'll show um, signs of possible hip dysplasia um, because of those looser ligaments when they actually don't have it. So we have to be careful about the timing when we do it. Conservative treatment, moderate exercise, Weight control is very important. The heavier the animal is, the more pressure we have on the weights. We can use anti-inflammatory medications, Rimadyl twice a day. Uh, if we're going to use aspirin, we, we, can use, we need to use buffered aspirin because it does inhibit like all the prostaglandins, which include the, the good prostaglandins um, that keep the, the um, lining of the stomach healthy. We can give that twice a day. Prednisone, if they're very severe, we can give them a steroid for anti-inflammatory reasons, we want to decrease it to the level that keeps them comfortable. So if something anti-inflammatory, there are nutraceuticals that can be helpful. Polysulfated glycosaminoglycan is called Adequan. It's an injection that we can give uh, weekly for about three weeks and then give it every six months or so and actually really helps with the, uh, uh, keeping the cartilage uh, built up within the joint, which provides protection for the joint. Glucosamine chondroitin sulfate or cosequin 
our nutraceuticals um, that people claim uh, that it works. It isn't a mild anti-inflammatory, but we really want to use nutraceuticals that contain a building block for cartilage, like something that contains hyaluronic acid, because that actually helps to slow down degenerative joint disease. Surgically, we can actually remove the head of the femur. That's called a femoral head osteectomy or an FHO. And if we remove it, it actually decreases pain. We have a workable joint. It's a false joint. It's made up of soft tissue, but the scar tissue that forms there has no nerve endings. So it makes it, a, they'll limp maybe, but it'll be non-painful limping because they will have a false joint uh, with no nerve endings there. You can see this animal has had an FHO where they've removed the neck, fed, head and neck of the femur so it has no contact within the joint, no bone to bone contact within the joint. And that creates a working joint um, that is stable. You can see the other side of this joint probably is going to need the same thing. We have major lysis of the bone or, or loss of calcium within this bone. So it'd be a good idea to go ahead and remove this and create another joint once this side is healed. Vigorous exercise is required after surgery at FHO to increase muscle strength and limb function. So we want them, you know, as soon as they are walking normally, we want them swimming, walking, running. Um, we want to add, we want adequate um, uh, exercise in order to build muscle strength. Short periods of exercise, five to ten minutes, three times a day, can be gradually lengthened into ten minutes, four times a day, as the animal gains strength. We want to use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs um, during rehabilitation. The limb that undergoes surgery may be slightly shorter than the opposite leg, and sometimes we'll see occasional lameness, um, but typically it's not due to pain um, unless we have a lot of weight on that joint and you are getting bone-to-bone uh, uh, -bone contact because it's compressing that scar tissue. It can take up to a year before we get optimal function on that limb, um, but we don't need to restrain them at all. Uh, when they're healing. Total hip replacement is the best, most effective way to get give a patient a functional, non-painful joint. And what happens is that with the procedure is it, it actually replaces the femoral head and neck together with the acetabular cup. This is a cobalt chrome shaft and head that are implanted directly, banged right into the femoral shaft and placed into an artificial acetabular cup. Isn't that a beautiful hip? Advantages, dogs achieve near normal hind limb function approximately 95% of the time. Patients achieve full range of motion in the joint and are free of pain, and they have a quick return to function. There is another surgical uh, process that we can do in young animals. It's called a pelvic osteotomy. It's a triple osteotomy. We make three holes in the pelvis, and then what it does is it changes the construction of the pelvis to allow the rotation of that dorsal acetabular rim so it provides increased coverage over the femoral head. It's technically difficult, so we only have this done by a, um, a specialist, but it does uh, provide for a good return of function with minimal osteoarthritis. Again, it does need to be performed in a dog that's about six months of age or less. Dogs intended for breeding should have their hips radiographed after two years of age, and we should not breed them before them. Signs of dysplasia may develop early in a dog's life, and it is a progressive disease. Degeneration of the joint continues through the life of the pet, but weight loss and moderate exercise can reduce the pain felt by the animal. I had a dog that I uh, got from a, a cousin of mine. He was over 100 pounds. He was about 120 pounds when I got him. I, put him, uh, I took x-rays. He had severe hip dysplasia. I put him on a diet. And when he was about 100, uh, 98 to 100 pounds, I took x-rays again, and his degenerative joint disease had significantly improved. And so we actually had a picture um, uh, of the, the poor disease and what can happen when you reduce the weight. So we really push the weight loss in these pets. Puppies born to hip dysplasia-free parents may actually experience development of dysplasia, so it's not a guarantee. Surgery is the only cure for the disease, Hip dysplasia is usually not seen in cats or small breed dogs. This is an interesting disease of avascular necrosis. It's also called leg calf perthes disease after the three the, um, scientists who discovered it. It is a non-inflammatory, aseptic, 
necrosis. So there's no inflammation, there's no bacteria, um, and it, but it causes the death of the femoral head and neck, and it's a disease of small breed dogs. The exact cause is unknown, but some vascular compression together with some hormone activity has been suggested. In affected dogs, the femoral head and neck undergo necrosis and then deformation. So the bone dies and deforms. The articular cartilage cracks and then collapses because of the collapse of the subchondral bone, and that is painful and the joint won't be able to be used normally. We we'll see this in toy breeds and terriers most commonly. Clinical signs, it affects young dogs between five and eight months of age. They're predisposed to leg calf perthes disease. You'll see irritability and chewing at the hip or flank area. So not always will you see lameness, but they'll, you'll start to see a, uh, a, they'll chew at that area because it just is painful. So we see pain, atrophy of the muscles in the hip noticeably, and a gradual onset of lameness. So it won't happen all of a sudden. Um, X-rays will show us decreased bone density in the femoral head and neck area, a flattened femoral head, and osteophytes in the joint. This is the normal side. This is the destruction of that femoral head. Okay. So again, we have a normal hip here. On the other side, we see bone loss here. It's not as significant as this one. I've got a picture of this pretty little Yorkie because we see it in toy breeds. Treatment, we want to do an excision arthroplasty, which is basically an FHO, a femoral head osteectomy. Postoperative tre treatment requires early active use of the limbs. So we want to get them back on their feet as quickly as possible. As early as two weeks after surgery, we want them to swim or run. Return to pain-free function may occur as early as 30 days after surgery. Animals may have both hips involved, so we may need to do surgery on both hips, and there may be a genetic predisposition for the disease. Animals do require frequent physical therapy during recovery, so exercise, passive range of motion exercises, um, because we want that joint to be usable, and in order to be usable, that scar tissue needs to be somewhat movable. Um, if it develops in both hips, the surgeries on each side are performed usually 8 to 10 weeks apart. We need to allow some healing. Okay, this is a, a little bit more complex disease. It's called osteochondrosis dissecans. Osteochondrosis refers to degeneration or aseptic necrosis. So we have this aseptic necrosis, again, of bone and cartilage, followed by reossification. So reboning um, or, or cartilage applied to this cartilage. If the condition results in a dissecting cartilage flap, so what happens is we have bone loss, and then this flat, this cartilage is unstable, and so it breaks. And so if we have this flap, um, it causes inflammatory joint changes, and that is called osteochondrosis dissecans. So dissecans is when you have that cartilaginous flap. And here you see a dog that has been ne uh, necropsied. This is a dog that with degenerative changes in one of its um, joints, and this uh, joint looks normal, whereas this joint, you see a flap of cartilage uh, down to the bone. The underlying defect in this disease is one of endochondral ossification. So what happens is that there is a failure of the lower levels of the physial or articular cartilage to mature into bone, and that results in a thickened cartilage which is prone to injury. Lack of ossification occurs at the physis, the end of the bone, and problems such as a non-united anconeal process. Remember, I told you that um, there's an anconeal process in the humerus, and we're going to talk about it later. Here's where we're talking about it. That anconeal process fits within the olecranon um, fossa of the humerus, and so it's very difficult to see, on, even on x-ray. Um, but uh, that can cause a non-united anconeal process or retain cartilage cores, like we saw in this picture here. If it occurs at the articular surface, that's when we get OCD. The disease is seen in several joints, the shoulder, the stifle, the hock, and the elbow, uh, and uh, OCD of the scapulohumeral joint, or the shoulder, is the most commonly one seen. And that is actually the one that we see here. This is the humerus that fits into the scapula. 
failure of that articular cartilage to become cemented to the underlying bone together with a constant trauma during exercise results in that non-healing cartilage flap. It's like having a stone in your shoe. It keeps flapping up into your shoe. You keep feeling that stone. You don't want to walk on that foot. It's that, pro that presence of the flap that produces lameness and osteoarthritis. So here are stages of the disease. It'll look like normal bone, and then it'll look like kind of flattened bone, and then you'll get this flap off um, the, of cartilage off the bone, and this flap is causing problems. Now, when it becomes um, a flap within the joint, it may reossify, and if it reossifies, it definitely feels like there is a stone in your shoe, um, and we call those mics. So lameness is seen in large breed dogs, and they typically it's typically breed related. We see it a lot in Rottweilers. They'll be between three and 18 months of age. So they're young dogs. Radiographs may actually show this cartilaginous flap, um, especially uh, if it's completely flapped off the, the bone and is swimming around in the joint. We call those joint mice. Um, those are loose cartilage pieces, and typically they're reossified, which makes them a little easier to see because they're calcium deposits on them. Mineral deposits makes them easier to see in the x-ray. Treatment, rest, weight control in early stages. If they're lame, we can do a surgical removal of the flap and or the mice. Um, this is actually a very common disease in racehorses as well. So a return to normal function occurs almost immediately after surgery. Doesn't it return to you if you remove the stone from your shoe? Then it's it's practically just, you know, quickly go in, arthroscopy, clear it out, put them back um, uh, outside to run around. They're, they're good to go. It is normally a disease of large breed dogs. There may be a hereditary component. Like I said, Rottweilers seem to be predisposed. Panosteitis is, has a couple of names. It's also called endosteosis and eosinophilic panosteitis. It is a common disease that causes intermittent lameness in medium and large breed dogs. So they were lame yesterday in the right leg. They're not lame today. Tomorrow, they're lame in the left leg. The average age of onset is six to eight months. So it's during a, uh, a growth phase. The lameness is usually not acute, but it's associated with trauma or it's not associated with trauma. And it appears to from the to the owner that it shifts from leg to legs i swore that the, that dog was lame on the right side yesterday now it's lame on the other side male dogs are more commonly affected german shepherd breed being more uh, overrepresented it is self-limiting and virtually all dogs return to normal within the year but we do want to control those bouts of lameness and pain so we want to give them some analgesics and some non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs to make them more comfortable the cause is unknown, but there may be viral infection or a genetic predisposition. We see it a lot in German Shepherd dogs. Um, metabolic disease um, happening somewhere else in the body or some sort of allergic or hormonal excess. Think about when this occurs. It occurs at six to eight months of age in male dogs. And that's about the time that the testosterone starts to, to kick in. Viral infection is thought to be the most likely cause, um, but we don't know what the virus is or how it attacks them. The disease affects the medullary bone marrow and the endosteal bone, resulting in degeneration of the medullary marrow and the thickening of the endosteal bone. Long bones, such as the ulna, humerus, radius, and femur, and tibia are commonly involved. So intermittent lameness shifting from leg to leg. They may be anorexic, not want to eat, have fever, weight loss, reluctant to move. You're going to get pain if you push very deeply on the long bone. So if they're lame on that leg and you push deeply on the long bone, they're gonna go, ooh, that does feel funny. X-rays are gonna show a gray, hazy, patchy area of increased radio density within the center of the long bone. Analgesics and anti-inflammatory drugs uh, for pain. So aspirin, I, I keep putting aspirin in here because it is used. I don't like to use aspirin because it actually is, is uh, results in the degeneration of cartilage over time. Rimadyl actually builds up cartilage over time, so we like using Rimadyl instead. Phenylbutazone is also known as Bute, uh, can be given as well. It's another non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. We typically give Bute to horses. Panosteoitis is self-limiting and usually leaves no permanent damage. Um, 
Because bute and aspirin can cause gastric us upset, I prefer to use other non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, but we do want our uh, owners to report to us any gastric upset, vomiting of blood, blood in the stool, lack of appetite. Flare-up of the disease is common, so animals are going to look cured but then relapse, but we don't often see it in any animals older than two years of age. Luxations. Luxations of the hip are fairly common, secondary to trauma in small animals. All luxations involve tearing of the joint capsule and the round ligament of the hip. Specific signs can vary depending on the location of the femoral head with respect to the acetabulum. So the most common type is that femoral head is craniodorsal to the acetabulum. It's moved in front and on top of the acetabulum. The leg will appear to be shortened and the stifle rotates outward while the hawk rotates inward. Craniocaudal is rare. We don't often see it. Uh, Craniocaudal uh, means that it is um, uh, it is actually it's dorsocaudal. It's in the back of the hip and it's dorsal. And the stifle rotates inward and the hawk outward. Ventral is very rare. That affected limb will appear to be longer. So we'll have a history of trauma. They'll have acute non-weight-bearing lameness with maybe some swelling over the hip joint. We can do um, x-rays to rule out other diseases like femoral neck fractures, acetabular fractures, pelvic fractures, and, and leg calf perthes disease. Presence of fractures or bone chips indicates that we need to do an op open surgical reduction of that dislocation. Oftentimes, though, we can do a closed reduction. Um, it does require anesthesia. We need to get them completely relaxed. We want that those muscles to be relaxed, and we want to do this as soon as possible because the sooner we get it done, the easier it is to relax those muscles. Over time, those muscles will contract and scar tissue will form, and it will be hard to stretch that leg out and get that femoral head back in place. So what we'll actually do is sedate them or in, uh, anesthetize them pull that leg out and then rotate it back into the acetabulum. Um, with open reduction, we do it surgically. And we may need to place surgery, uh, uh, sutures in order to make sure that that secures the reduction. We wanna support that limb in a sling, the aimer sling, for a minimum of seven to 10 days. And after that, we wanna limit their exercise for three weeks. Um, we need scar tissue to build up in order to keep that luxation in place. The easier it is to get that back into place, the harder it is for that to heal. Because if it's easy to get in, that means those ligaments are really torn up. The prognosis will depend on the stability of the reduced joint and the amount of soft tissue injury. Uh, varying degrees of osteoarthritis can develop after a traumatic luxation. We may have to do an FHO if the hip cannot remain um, redu reduced. All right, we're gonna talk about muscle. Diseases that affect muscle are uh, myopathies. And there are many types of myopathies that exist, but the most common ones that we see are inflammatory, immune-mediated, and acquired myopathies. Inflammatory myopathies like bacterial myositis rarely occurs in the dog and the cat, but it usually will occur after a bite wound, trauma, or contamination after surgical procedures. The most common bacteria that we find in those are Staphylococcus and Clostridia. In large animals, the most common one we find are the Clostridial species. Remember um, anthrax, black leg disease, um, uh, tetanus, those are all Clostridial species that cause myopathies. Treatment should be based on culture and sensitivity results. Um, we could get a protozoal myositis. Uh, if we have cysts, protozoa um, are very uh, small one-celled um, parasites. And if they form cysts within the muscles of toxoplasmosis positive cats, we'll get a protozoal myositis. Rupture of those cysts or an immune response to their presence will result in that muscle hyperesthesia. I mean, they're very, very painful. This is an exam example of white cells within muscle uh, the muscle body. So these are fascicles of muscle, and in between these fascicles, we're seeing an um, infiltration of um, white cells, and we should not see that. So that indicates a myositis. Immune-mediated myopathies. Polymyositis is an immune-mediated inflammation of the muscles 
that affects dogs and cats. We see it in middle-aged large breed dogs most commonly. Um, it's weakness, it causes a weakness that gets worse with exercise. It causes hyperesthesia on palpation, so it'll be very painful when we palpate those muscles. Fever and depression, those are all signs of muscle involvement. Some of these dogs may also have megasophagus, so an enlarged esophagus because the muscle is not contracting, so it dilates, and then muscle atrophy when we see have chronic cases. Diagnosis is most readily obtained through a muscle biopsy, and the treatment involves giving prednisone, an immunosuppressive uh, um, dose of, of prednisone. Masticatory muscle myositis is also known as atrophic myositis or eosinophilic myositis. Um, atrophic meaning we have uh, less muscle mass and eosinophilic meaning we have lots of eosinophils or an allergic response. Um, it involves the muscles of mastication in the dog. These muscles contain a special type of fiber that has antigenic properties possibly shared with bacteria. Um, so the immune system sees it as bacteria and attacks it. Infections anywhere else in the body will incite this immune response that then will attack the muscle fibers. It just gets confused. So the masticatory muscles uh, initially become swollen and painful. And with, if it's happening chronically, those muscles will atrophy and fibrose. These animals will not be able to fully open or close their mouths. So eating is very difficult. Drinking is very difficult. Glucocorticoids are the treatment of choice in this case. This is an example of a dog with myositis of the tongues, the corgi. And uh, so you can see this tongue. It looks abnormal. Um, it looks like he can't even pull it into his mouth. Um, and these are cross sections of the tongue and the amount of um, dead tissue, vacuolated tissue um, within that. that should, those should be um, muscles, uh, muscle fibers, and you don't see them. Um, lots of white blood cells in there uh, attacking the muscles. Acquired myopathies. Feline polymyopathy occurs in cats of all ages, sexes, and breeds. And it is a result of hypokalemia, so low potassium levels that results in cervical ventriflexion. So they are um, uh, pulling their chin down to their chest, periodic weakness, and muscle pain. This picture of this cat is a cat with po uh, feline polymyopathy. These symptoms may occur concurrently with renal disease, and the treatment involves supplementation of potassium and adjustment of the diet, treatment of the renal disease. So here's another cat with polymyopathy, um, causing muscle weakness, pain, swelling, or atrophy. Um, so clinical signs will give us the diagnosis. We can do a muscle biopsy to, to um, further diagnose it, and some serum chemistries will show us that creatinine levels may be increased. We can treat with appropriate antibiotics if it's a bacterial cause, antiprotozoal drugs if it's parasite re related, and then glucocorticoids are needed daily and sometimes long-term in, in cases. Most animals will show improvement with treatment, but treatment may be required for the life of the animal. Early intervention, as with most diseases, improves the prognosis. Tumors of the bone, the diagnosis of bone cancer is devastating to the animal, the owner, and the veterinarian. Um, and I would argue the veterinary technician. Um, the, there is a high incident rate of bone cancer in pet animals, especially in dogs, and the onset of disease is often acute with the progression of signs rapid. So um, they'll have a healthy dog, two or four year old uh, Labrador retriever running around, all of a sudden falls down, extremely painful. We see a fracture because we've had a bone tumor that's been growing um, undetected and Finally, there's, uh, because the bone tumor is eating at the bone, there's um, uh, not enough uh, bone to hold it together, so it fractures and you get a sudden uh, acute lameness. Approximately 8,000 cases of bone cancers are seen in dogs each year. Of these, 85 to 90% involve osteosarcoma, which is a primary bone neoplasm. Most common bones affected are distal radius, proximal humerus, so close to the elbow, distal femur and proximal tibia away from the knee. I'm sorry, distal, distal radius, proximal humerus, uh, away from the elbow, distal femur, proximal tibia, close to the knee. So away from the femur, close to the, or away from the elbow, close to the knee is uh, how we remember the, the sites of osteosarcoma. 
Disease is commonly seen in large breed male dogs of seven years of age. I've seen it in dogs as young as two. Most of these tumors show microscopic spread by the time they are diagnosed, so they've already metastasized. 90% of all animals diagnosed with bone cancer die despite treatment. This is why it's devastating. Primary bone cancer in cats is less common. As many as 90% of those bone cancers seen in cats are also osteosarcomas. Survival rates after amputation appear to be somewhat better than those for dogs. So um, we will always recommend that we um, amputate the limb um, as quickly as possible. If we see it in a dog or a cat, we do have longer survival rates for both of those animals, but it's better for cats than dogs. So what are we, we going to see? We're going to see sudden lameness, typically. Uh, it will be sudden, but occasionally it will be chronic. It will be happening over time. Weight loss, they will be extremely painful over the affected bone. And there may be some swelling, bony swelling in that affected limb. Radiographs will show a mixed osteolysis, so loss of bone, also a proliferation of bone around the outside of the tumor and a periosteal reaction. So we'll see kind of inflammation of the lining around uh, the bone as well. Biopsy is required for diagnosis. And I often recommend biopsy because sometimes it will look like cancer, but it will be a fungal infection. So I do recommend that we do a biopsy before we completely panic. We do want to do thoracic radiographs so we can rule out metastatic tumors. We want to do that before you put them under any anesthetic procedure. Amputation of the affected limb is required. If they don't want to do that, we are going to lose the animal much sooner. Um, Follow-up treatment with cisplatin or carboplatin. It's a chemotherapeutic agent. Can increase survival time. Radiation therapy can provided, be provided for pain control. There are no recommended drug therapies that exist for cats. Bone cancer is fatal. Survival times of up to 12 months may be achieved if we use aggressive treatment. Biopsy of the tumor is necessary to confirm the tumor type. Amputation is required to remove the primary tumor, but it will not affect metastatic tumor cells elsewhere in the body. And remember, almost all the time, there it's already occurred. Drug therapy is expensive, and patients require laboratory ma- monitoring on top of the therapy to avoid bone marrow or renal toxicities from the treatment. So away from the elbow toward the knee. This is what we'll see, a big um, painful swelling Uh, This is what we'll see under radiograph osteolysis, um, osteoproliferation of bone, and a pan osteotis. So you can actually see the lining of the bone here because it is inflamed. That's what we have for the diseases of the musculoskeletal system. It's a lot. You want to categorize them into joint damage, bone damage, cancer, just like the, the list of diseases that I had in the front of the lecture. Bring those questions to me. We want to answer those.